thank you very much to both of you for presenting two different views, a robotic future vision for exploration in the solar system and beyond, and the things that we need to consider as humans preparing to go out for human spaceflight. We have just a few minutes before our next break, and so I'll ask you maybe one or two quick questions, and I would love to also get a question from the audience, so be mulling over what you'd like to ask these two. The first is, where are the synergies that we can find between robotic spaceflight and human spaceflight? How do you two both see these as two complementary features of the future of space exploration? Is it a vision like Neil, Steven or, uh, Neil Stevenson in Seven Eves, where it swarms of robots assisting for an exploration mission? Are they going to be the vanguards, the scouts going out again as they already have before we get there? How do we combine the two? Well, I think it's both of the above, as, as we kind of intimated before, that. Robotics are the precursors. I mean, we did the same thing with Apollo, with Ranger and Surveyor. We're doing the same thing on Mars. And if we ever go out to the outer planets, we're doing those things now. So they're the precursors, but they're, they're also the, the enablers when you do have humans there. I mean, look at the robotic capability we put on the space station. I mean, that's enabling more than we could do with the astronauts. So it, it is absolutely a precursor as well as an enabler when we're there. And, and that's how we look at it. And we've got to be nice to them, too. <laughs> don't want to piss off the robots. That always turns out bad. Yeah. And we see from science fiction maltreatment of robot populations or of AI populations <laughs> does come back to, to bite us in the future. So yes, I think there's an importance. And one of our researchers here at the Media Lab, Kate Darling, thinks really thoughtfully about ethics around robots and human-robot interaction as well. What would you each say are the grand milestones that are in your near future for robotic spaceflight and for human spaceflight? Grand visions. Oh, gosh. I, so what I, it's interesting. So what I'm excited about right now is point-to-point -point transportation. Mm -hmm. It seems not as grand as like going out and yeah. exploring far, the far reaches, but um, it's something we haven't mastered yet. You know, we don't have um, a clear path how we're going to get there. And, and I think that's going to be really game-changing. It's when you can uh, get anywhere in the world in less than an hour. Mm -hmm because um, part of the game of like bringing the world together. You know, it's, it's a lot easier to, um, you know, to m marry someone from a different continent if you could just fly <laughs> home for Christmas, you know, <laughs> in less than an hour. So it makes things, it makes it easier for us to become a, a small planet. So, but I do have to say, I'll do, I will do the pitch for my retirement cruise to Saturn. <laughs> so whenever I talk at schools, I'm always like, you guys, you got to study hard because we do not have this technology and I need to go to Saturn. <laughs> so uh, work on that, would you? Get to the Cassini yeah. team, and yeah. yeah, I can chat yeah. about that. How about yourself? Uh, I mean, I, I was breaking into two things. One grand vision for us at JPL, frankly, is understanding our Earth. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have a lot of spacecraft that are looking back and understanding carbon cycle and water cycle and, you know, helping us mm -hmm. maintain this fragile environment that we live in. And so that's certainly just, it drives many of our folks uh, to really have an impact in that arena, number one. And number two is as we go out into the solar system and look beyond, it's like, is there life or the conditions for life? And you know, that's, that's the big question that started driving us 60 years ago. And again, the water that's out there and the excitement that that generates and understanding that, that, that vision of, and we have this question, are we, will we find evidence or the potential for life in the solar system or with our exoplanet work outside the solar system? And how will that play out? Fantastic answers from both of you. Yeah. Can you give me a crisp example of a lesson that was learned from one of your, say, prior test flights at Virgin Galactic or Mars Curiosity or the work for Mars 2020 that has shaped or, or influenced your next step, say, for Europe, a clipper, or Europe, a lander, or where you guys will go next with Virgin Galactic. Is there a lesson from these precursor years of exploration and development that you are thinking has shaped where we're going next? I, I would say our key lesson is going out beyond the Earth is just hard. <laughs> uh, and, and I'll use the Marco spacecraft as a small example. You know, our two little CubeSats that flew out to Mars, but frankly, they required tons of care and feeding to get them there. Yeah. Uh, just because first time we'd done this, components were kind of semi-commercial and things were happening we didn't understand. Or you get, you know, you try to drill into the planet. Hmm, not going like we thought. So it, you have the sci-fi, which, you know, kind of makes it look, easy to do this, <laughs> uh, but the reality is that it takes a lot of hard engineering and science and just stick to it and figure it out. And Incredibly so rigorous. You can't forget technical. that. And every mission is, you know, it's not like the last one. Yeah, no, it's, so that's, I have to say the same thing. It's, space is hard. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we uh, started in 2005, we thought we'd be flying in like 2007. Mm. 
Um, and we did our first space flight in 2018. So it, it and there was, there's a lot of challenges, there's a lot of setbacks. Mm -hmm. And really the take home is like, this is a marathon, not a sprint. You gotta be willing to pick yourself up, you know, fall down seven times, get up eight, mm -hmm. um, and take care of each other. Because yeah. if you wanna, you gotta get it for the long haul. Yeah. Great. Can I entertain a question or two from the audience? And we have our microphone box to pass around here. Rob. So, so yesterday, Walt Cunningham gave us some words of advice and said, uh, you gotta stick your neck out. So how do we do that? How do we implement that and, and go forward, balance risk, and, and take the advice from someone who's, who's been there, been to the moon, and been, okay. I mean, we, I think on the commercial side, there is a, um, a bigger tolerance for risk. Um, and so you, you see a lot of risk taking going on there. Um, and I think that is really important for the development. I mean, I think it's important to understand, have everyone involved, in, um, knowing and appreciating like what we're doing and why. Um, and that's what allows us to do that. I think it's, um, it's more challenging in, in the government environment because you have, you're beholden to other stakeholders like Congress and they, I in my experience, I found Congress to not, to be more risk averse than I am. Um, and so um, that takes that. That's, I think that's where it takes the, the courage, and to, to stand up and say, "No, this is worth it. This is what we're going to do." And I think our our kind of philosophy is we want to take smart risks because, again, we're generally doing things that no one has done, and so trying to figure out, okay, how do we do this? Uh, it is a risk. You know, you look at the sky crane with Mars. You know, with Curiosity, that's crazy. Uh, and, and yet we figured out this is the only way you can do it. Let's take the risk. We've got to do this. And so it's about taking smart risks, but you know, we have no issue with sticking our neck out. It's just, let's do it smartly and try to make sure that we have a good chance of success. And I think both your institutions have this reputation now for sticking your neck out and really pushing incredibly innovative robotic space flight, the scouts for the solar system and our human understanding of so many of the different planets in our near neighborhood and the ability to say we really are going to push back out to get humans flying in space, whether it's space tourism or beyond. So yeah. One last question and then we'll prepare for the break. In the back, I saw a hand shoot up. <laughs> you got to tie him up. Yeah. <laughs> time, time to see. Well, luckily, our missions are, you know, under two hours. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> got to hold it together for it. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, that's not to say you can't have an, an, any kind of emergency in that time frame, but. Um, it's, it's not as dramatic as that, um, but that is what I'm interested in. That is what, uh, for the, cause I do, I want to go for the longer missions. I want to get us to the moon. I want us to get to Mars. I want us to live in, in open space. And that's what I was saying, why we have to raise the bar on ourselves, our own growth and development and our growth of our team and the growth of our of the society. Because when you have 10,000 people living and working in space together, you can't afford for one person to have a, a breakdown like that because we're so vulnerable out there. You know, one person could kill us all if they wanted to so easily when we're in space because it's such a harsh environment. So we have to get better at this. We have to be more open. We have to be more honest. We have to learn to talk about things that are taboo. All our taboos, um, sex, uh, death, suicide, you know, these things are, um, all those secrets that we hold, they're killing us. And so as, until as a society we've evolved and we've learned to handle these things and be more, more responsible with our mental health and our, and our culture, um, we're, we're not gonna be ready. And so I, that's why I want us to start talking about these things in our, in our culture because we're the pointy end of the, of the arrow. You know, we gotta figure these things out so that we don't have to resort to tying people to their space cots. <laughs> gotta come up with something better. Yeah. 
Wonderful. And I'll give Larry a chance to close with any final thoughts as well on if this is what is captivating Virgin Galactic for thinking about the future and next steps to your question. What's on the mind of JPL? What's next? Well, again, I think, as I said, it's, it's really uh, answering those hard science questions. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the beauty of, of a scientific uh, community that says, how do we answer these questions? Again, I go back to Dr. Ting's presentation. You know, we find out things when we go there and things that we didn't expect or understand, and then we have to put those into our models. And so that's really what drives us every day is, you know, what's the next question we want to answer? Fantastic. Well, thank you both so much. Please give a round of applause to Larry and Loretta.